Can I ask you first, as an Arab, as a Palestinian, as a human being, a mother, how you're feeling ever since October 7th? Well, look, Christian, I cannot begin to describe to you the depth of the grief, the pain, and the, uh, the shock uh, that we are feeling here in Jordan. All of us are united in this grief, regardless of our origin. Uh, we are just, just can't believe the images that we're seeing every single day coming out of Gaza. We're going to bed uh, seeing those images and waking up to them. You know, I don't know how to, you know, as a mom, We've seen uh, Palestinian mothers who've had to write the names of their children on their hands because the chances of them being shelled to death, of their bodies turning into corpses, are so high. I, you know, I just want to remind the world that Palestinian mothers love their children just as much as any other mother in the world. And for them to have to go through this is just unbelievable. And equally, I think the people all around uh, the Middle East, including in Jordan, we are just shocked and disappointed by the world's reaction to this catastrophe that is unfolding. In the last couple of weeks, we have seen you know, a glaring double standard uh, in the world. When October 7th happened, the world immediately and unequivocally uh, stood by Israel and uh, its right to defend itself and condemned uh, the attacks that happened. But when we, what we're seeing in the last couple of weeks, we have, we're seeing silence in the world. Um, you know, the countries have stopped at just expressing concern or acknowledging the casualties, but always with a preface of declaration of support uh, for Israel. And, you know, are we being told that it is wrong to kill a, a family, an entire family at gunpoint, but it's OK to shell them to death? I mean, there is a glaring double standard here. And it is just shocking to the Arab world. This is the first time in modern history that there is such human suffering and the world is not even calling for a ceasefire. So the silence is deafening. And to many in our region, it makes the Western world complicit, you know, um, through their support and through the cover that they give Israel, that it is just it's right to defend itself. Many in the Arab world are looking at the Western world as not just tolerating this, but as aiding and abetting it. And this is just uh, horrendous and, and it's deeply, deeply disappointing to all of us. Uh, Queen Rania, I'm going to ask you more about this and, 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 and go deeper into this, uh, you know, into your feelings about this. Um, but first, I want to ask you, you know, the Israelis are shocked to their core, the grief, the, 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 the you know, the, what happened to them has never happened in that way since the Holocaust. And they are shaken to their core, as I said, and the grief. I just want to get from you what you felt on October 7th. Well, of course, I was shocked. And, you know, Jordan has made its position very clear. We condemn the killing of any civilian, whether Palestinian or, or Israeli. That is Jordan's ethical and moral position. And it's also the position of Islam. Islam condemns. Uh, the killing of civilians. As my husband mentioned recently, uh, the Pact of Omar, which was issued on the gates of Jerusalem 15 centuries ago, uh, that's 1,000 years before the Geneva Conventions, orders Muslims not to hurt a, not to kill a woman, child, or, or elderly, or elderly person, and not to uh, destroy a tree or, 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 or hurt a, a priest. And so this is what we believe are the rules of engagement at time of war. But they need to apply to everybody. So, yes, there was the shock and there is the condemnation. But why isn't there equal condemnation to what is happening now? I just want to emphasize that uh, what happened uh, on October, this conflict did not begin on October 7th, although it has been being portrayed as that. You know, most networks are covering the story under the title of Israel at War. But for many Palestinians on the other side of the separation wall, on the other side of the barbed wire, war has never left. This is a 75-year-old story, a story of overwhelming death and displacement to the Palestinian people. It is a story of an, uh, an occupation under an apartheid reg regime that, that occupies land, that, that um, demolishes houses, confiscates land, uh, military incursions, night raids, you know, the context of a nuclear-armed regional superpower that occupies, oppresses, 
and commits daily documented crimes against Palestinians is missing from the narrative. Queen Rania? You know, for too long, Palestinians' lives... I'm sorry to interrupt you. I want to ask you a specific question because you're using a lot of words which clearly many in your, you know, in, in the Arab world have used, words like apartheid and the rest. But you know that you are going to come under a lot of criticism from Israel and its supporters. And I'm wondering whether you're coming out to speak... But let me just emphasise... But let me just emphasise that, that apartheid is a designation that was given not by Arabs, but by Israeli and international human rights organisations. You wrote in an Instagram story just in the last week, it isn't self-defence if you're an occupying force and you show the destruction of Gaza. And you have posted a video of yourself from a presser in 2009 during that war, uh, saying it is heartbreaking to see how little has changed. The world cannot remain silent. This, this has to stop. Do you feel that you have a particular voice, you know, as Queen of Jordan, in a country that has a peace treaty with Israel, to speak up? It's not about me. It's about speaking up for humanity. You know, this is not about, uh, you know, being pro-Israeli or pro-Palestinian. Uh, this is about choosing the people, the everyday people on both sides. And, you know, uh, and explaining again that the, the Palestinian people have for too long been living under oppression and a dehumanization. You know, uh, you know, they suffer daily indignities and human rights violations, whether they're being jailed or humiliated or harassed. They do not have freedom of movement. Uh, there are f over 500 checkpoints uh, scattered all over the West Bank. You have a separation wall, which is deemed illegal by the International Court of Justice that has separated the territories into 200 disconnected enclaves. And, you know, you've seen the aggressive expansion of settlements on Palestinian land. And those have interrupted the territorial contiguity of the territories and has deemed an autonomous, independent Palestinian state not viable. So you are seeing all these. This is the background of this conflict. There is a hyperfixation on Hamas now because of the late, what that happened the last uh, couple of weeks. But this is a problem that far precedes Hamas and will continue after Hamas. This is a fight for freedom and for justice. And that is what, what needs to be heard. Can I ask you this question then? Because, you know, a, a, a quite a brave, um, I think she's Saudi anyway, a journalist on the Saudi television network Al Arabiya, took this and hammered Khalid Mashal, the former head of, of Hamas, and said to him, the butchery, well, that's my word, but she said, what everybody's seen on their screens has, you know, turned the world away from the Palestinian cause. And just to expand, people are saying Hamas and what it did has brought this down on these poor people of Gaza. Do you accept that? Well, I believe, I do not believe in, as I said, in the, in the killing of civilians. But this is a story of violence that has been going on now for so long. And this violence needs to be condemned. But at the end of the day, what we're seeing today and what people need to understand is that, yes, you know, under the guise of, of uh, the right to defend itself, we are witnessing atrocities. You know, every country has a right to defend itself, but not through any means, not through war crimes, not through collective punishment. You know, 6,000 people, civilians killed so far, 2,400 children. How is that self-defense? We are seeing butchery at a mass scale using pre precision weapons, you know. Um, so for the past two weeks, we have seen the, 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 the indiscriminate bombardment uh, of Gaza. Um, Entire families wiped out, N residential neighborhoods flattened to the ground, the targeting of hospitals and schools and churches and, and, and mosques and medical workers, journalists, UN uh, aid workers. Mm -hmm. How is that self-defense? Mm -hmm. You know, uh, uh, why, is, why is it that whenever uh, Israel commits these atrocities, it comes under the banner of self-defense, but when there's a uh, uh, violence by Palestinians, it is immediately d d d d called terrorism. Is the word terrorist just reserved 
for exclusively for Muslims and Arabs. Well, let me ask there's, you then. There's a real double standard here your, that we're seeing. Your husband, and King Abdullah. there's a whole symmetry that we see. Mm -hmm. Well, let me ask you this. Your husband, King there's Abdullah. There's a symmetry at, because these are not two equal people in the conflict. You know, one is an occupier and one is the occupied. One has a, a military, one of the mightiest in the world, and the other doesn't have a military, military at all. So there is a false symmetry here that is being drawn. And there's also, you know, when you say the right to defend itself, that does not say the entire story. It doesn't say the story of the violation of international law, international humanitarian law. It doesn't tell you the suffering and the, and the uh, story of an occupation. You know, Israel is in violation of no less than 30 UN security resolutions that require it and it alone to act, to withdraw from territories occupied in 1967, to stop the settlements, the separation wall, the human rights violations. This is at the crux of this issue. It is not this hyperfixation on Hamas.